Hello and welcome back to Jennifer's Lessons. And today we will be beginning with a chapter from Class 10 ICSC History, the Contemporary World Section, the First World War that was from 1914 to 1918. So, uh, the war that broke out in 1914 was different from the previous wars in many ways. Firstly, the war was fought on the land and in the air on the sea and under it. You can understand every sphere that we see that is on the land, in the air, on the sea, under the sea, everywhere this thing was fought. So this is completely different from the previous wars which had broken out. Uh, also with all the resources of the world mobilized for military purposes. So for military purposes, every single resource that has been mobilized in the world was used for this. Secondly, the war, the war began in Europe, but very soon it spread to continents of Asia and Africa as well. Thirdly, its deadly consequences were felt all over the world. These are the reasons why the war is referred to as the First World War. So, let's see the main causes of the First World War. The Great War of 1914 was not due to any single cause, but due to an accumulation of explosive material for many years. So, the first point is intense nationalism. An important cause of the war was intense nationalism or competitive patriotism. Germany had Kaiser Wilhelm II as her new emperor. Remember the emperor's name? Kaiser Wilhelm II. This was Germany's emperor. He went about proclaiming that Germany was going to be the leader of the world. So what did he proclaim? That Germany was going to be the leader of the world. He wanted to establish a vast German, uh, vast German empire and gain important position in the international sphere. So you can see this is Kaiser William II. Okay. France and Germany were old rivals. After defeating France in the Franco-Persian War, uh, of eight, that was from 1870 to 71, Germany had seized the province of Alsace and most parts of Lorraine, which were rich in minerals and industrial products. So, in the Franco-Prussian War, when France was defeated, Germany had managed to seize the province of Alsace and most parts of Lorraine, which were rich in minerals and industrial products. The French dreamed of revenge and of taking back their lost provinces. The Italians also looked discontented. It was their desire to get back Trentino and the region uh, around the port of Trieste, which uh, were inhabited by Italians but were still part of Austria-Hungary. Then there was the unsatisfied national spirit of the Balkan states, Serbia and Bulgaria, of Poland and of the people of Austria-Hungary. The political leaders and rulers succeeded in fanning hatred and passion under the cover of nationalism. So this whole nationalism thing here had actually become a cover for just fanning and uh, increasing the fire of hatred. The second reason was an armament race. It, uh, it was this intense nationalism. The first point is very much related to this one. From that intense nationalism, what happened was it turned Europe into an assembly of vast armed camps. Each country went on preparing for war and arming itself to the teeth. Everything that they could do to prepare themselves for a great war, every country did it. Germany had acquired colonies in Africa and a few islands in the Pacific. In order to protect her colonies, Germany began to build a powerful navy. The Germans dig uh, the Kiel Canal deeper so that the battleships could find shelter in its waters. England requested Germany not to make such naval preparations, but she did not pay any heed, which increased the hostilities between the nations. Germany, of course, was a very intensely nationalist, was in a very intense nationalistic feeling and was really wanting to fight everything off and be the leader of the world. So uh, Germany did not pay any heed to whatever others requested. So this increased the hostilities between these nations. Uh, Britain and France were concerned about Germany's growing military strength since Germany did not listen to anyone and kept on and on increasing its military. So Britain and France started getting a bit concerned over here. There was an arms race or what we call the armament race. Uh, it's better that you write armament because uh, 
it's a more uh, it's a more fancier keyword than just saying arms race and the particular feature of such a race is that if one country increases its armaments other countries are compelled to do the same so when germany was making these armaments britain and france and the other countries nearby who were in a chance of getting into a war with germany had to prepare to save themselves for every battleship built by germany two such ships were built by england you can understand everything that germany did the others had to do it in double in order to prevent the war or in order to protect themselves such a race for armaments could only end in a war the krupps in germany wicker armstrong in england and schneiders in france owned high profit armament industries the defense uh, spending had increased irrationally between 1908 and 1940. So the de defense spending, meaning the economic value or the amount of money and the financial sector that is spent behind the defense or the military strength, this uh, spending or this expenditure of money, the amount of money actually had increased pretty irrationally, like without any... Uh, Without any proper thought, it had increased between this period of 1908 to 1914. Next is, uh, this This comes as a question generally uh, because of the two blocks that took, uh, became. So the third uh, cause is division of Europe into two armed caps, the Triple Alliance and the Triple Entente. Uh, in uh, 1879, Germany and Austria-Hungary had signed a treaty to help each other in case of enemy attack. Three years later, Italy joined the pact. This pact came to be known as the Triple Alliance. In opposition to this Triple Alliance, what emerged was called the Triple Entente, comprising of Britain, France and Russia in 1907 uh, to control this German expansionism, since Germany had already uh, taken up uh, Austria, Hungary and Italy into a pact uh, and had decided that they'll help each other in case of enemy attacks. What Britain, France and Russia did uh, to control this expansionism and this policy of uh, taking people together and preparing for a war, they did is they too uh, uh, made an alliance which was called the Triple Entente. The French term Entente means understanding or alliance. So uh, simply both of them are triple alliances but uh, this uh, opposition used another term for alliance in order uh, to be distinguished. Thus, Europe was divided into two major camps, or as in the question comes, two what were the two major blocks? So on one side were the England, France and Russia, and on the other, Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy and later Turkey. So you must remember the names of the countries and under which block they fall. So, England, France and Russia were triple entente and uh, this Germany, Austria, Hungary, Italy and Turkey were triple alliance. The suspicions, fears, rivalry and enmity between the two camps was a major step towards World War I. Next reason is imperialism, that is the race for colonies. There was a mad struggle among the European nations for new territories in Africa and Asia in the 19th century. Great Britain established many colonies in Africa, followed by France, Spain, and uh, Portugal, and Belgium. Britain and France had occupied most of the regions of Africa. When Germany entered the race for establishing colonies, Britain and France made a secret agreement in uh, 1904. According to this agreement, Britain was to have political control over Egypt, and France was to take over Morocco. But the French claim over Morocco was opposed by Germany. Since Germany was new to this, uh, new to entering this uh, uh, colonial race to occupy col colonies, thing is, uh, when this Britain and France had the secret agreement of uh, dividing this place and take, uh, when Britain agreed to take political control over Egypt, France was supposed to take over to Morocco. But the French claim was actually opposed by Germany. The German emperor proclaimed that he would uphold the independence of Morocco and her sultan. So the Ger Germany supported Morocco and uh, Morocco's uh, leader. He said that he said all the nations should have equal opportunities to trade with that country. Germany tried to force her opinion on France by sending a 
gunboat Panther. The war between these nations seemed imminent, but it was averted partly owing to American mediation. So America intervened here and uh, partly uh, co contributed to not uh, causing the war immediately. Next fifth cause are the Balkan Wars in uh, 1912, four Balkan countries, Serbia, Bulgaria, Montenegro, and uh, Greece started a war against the Turks. Turkey lost most of her possessions in Europe, and in the Second Balkan War in 1913, Serbia and Greece, uh, supported by Russia, defeated Bulgaria, an ally of Austria. So Austria decided to put an end to the Serbian power. Kaiser confirmed Germany's willingness to, take, uh, to support any action taken against Serbia. So you can understand. What is happening in these cases is that just one person, one country starts to fight with the other and the other uh, plots revenge and someone comes and helps the other. This is how uh, this uh, thing got amplified. It started in probably very small wars, but uh, it led to uh, intense hatred among these uh, nations, among these countries. And uh, what uh, finally led to was actually pretty horrible. No effective international organization for the preservation of peace. There was no effective machinery to enforce law among the nations. Two attempts were uh, made to arrive at an agreement on the question of limitation of armament. So they had tried to make an agreement uh, which would have uh, limited the armaments, uh, the military spending that could be done by each country. So the first Hague conference met in 1899 at the invitation of Tsar Nicholas II of Russia. To this conference, some 26 nations sent their delegates. An important proposal before the conference was that the nations should decide not to increase their armies or their war budget for five years. So uh, if they had uh, agreed to this uh, first Hague conference, what would have happened was that the nations would not be able to increase the size of their armies or uh, the war budget for five whole years. <clears throat> Nothing of this sort could be decided there because of Germany's opposition to the said proposal. A second conference met at Hague in uh, 1907. This also failed to secure the desired results. So just like the first Hague conference, even the second conference that made, met at Hague in 1907, they failed to secure the desired results. Number seven, the seventh cause of this first world war was the Sarajevo crisis, the immediate cause. This was actually a kind of trigger. The people of Bosnia, which was annexed by Austria in 1908, were Serbians by ancestry. They wanted a union with other Slavic states and they fought against the Austro-Hungarian government. On 28th June 1914, the Archduke Francis Ferdinand, the Crown Prince of Austria and his wife were assassinated at Sarajevo, the capital city of Bosnia. The assassin was, uh, the assassin was Gavrilo Princip, a 19-year-old Bosnian the first student revolutionary to change the course of history of Europe. So this uh, crown prince of Bosnia named Archduke Francis Ferdinand and uh, his wife were assassinated at the capital city of Bosnia. You can understand the crown prince of Bosnia murdered at the capital city of Bosnia. This was a very uh, huge triggering effect and the assassin had been the first student revolutionary who had changed the course of history of Europe. The name was Gavrilo Princip, who was a 19-year-old Bosnian. Though Princip was an Austrian subject, the assassination had been planned in Serbia by a secret society of patriotic terrorists called Black Hand. They wanted to achieve the union of all South Slavs under Serbia. Serbia was blamed for Archduke's assassination. Austria presumed uh, and uh, that Princip and fellow conspirators had received their guns and bombs in the Serbian capital with the help of Serbian officials. Austria sent a stiff ultimatum to Serbia for appre apprehending the criminals and handing them over to the Austrian government. She sought ban on all anti-Austrian publications, anti-Austrian schools, anti-Austrian meetings, 
and they were also required to take steps to suppress all revolutionary movements against the territorial integrity of the Austrian government. The Serbian government refused to accept some of the demands of the ultimatum on the ground that they had involved violation of its sovereignty. What is sovereignty? The authority to govern itself. So the Serbian government refused to accept some of the demands of that ultimatum because they felt that uh, some of those demands were actually violating the sovereignty or they were violating the fact that they could govern themselves. And the world war begins. Austria declared war on Serbia on 28th July 1914. Russia mobilized her troops to defend Serbia and warned Austria of the consequences. Germany declared war on Russia on August 1st and on France on August 3rd. So remember these dates. The first trigger was in Austria, which declared war on Serbia on 28th July 1914. Germany declared war on Russia on August 1st, the 1st of August. And on France on 3rd of August. Remember these dates. Great Britain declared war on Germany on 4th August. So you can understand each and every country was declaring war on the other one every alternate day or almost every day. When the German army invaded Belgium, whose neutrality had been guaranteed by England. So 4th August, this war which Great Britain declared on Germany was because Germany uh, the German army had invaded Belgium. So Belgium's neutrality, that the Belgium, uh, this place would be neutral in all cases, was actually guaranteed by England. So Great Britain had to come down to fight. All the five powers, Austria, Germany, Russia, France and Britain, who, uh, who joined in the hostilities on uh, claims of fulfilling their obligations, made it a world war. Turkey and Bulgaria joined the side of Germany. Italy left the Triple Alliance and joined war against Germany. So Italy, you, have, you must remember that it was a part of the Triple Alliance which had Germany. And uh, Italy left uh, this side and joined uh, war against Germany in the other bloc. So uh, Italy had finally declared war against Germany and Austria-Hungary in 1915. Japan declared war on Germany with the aim of capturing German colonies in the Far East. The war ended on 11th November 1918, uh, which was the Armistice Day. There were many war events in the middle, but we don't have it in the syllabus. So uh, we will directly go to the end of the war. The entry of USA in the Great War brightened the hope of victory to the Allies. Britain, France, and the United States launched a massive military offensive in July 1918. Subsequently, the Germans were pushed back and the German Emperor Kaiser Wilhelm, uh, William uh, lost hopes of winning the war. He abdicated the throne and fled to the Netherlands. Germany became a republic and a new government signed the armistice, the, which is an agreement to stop fighting. So uh, the definition of armistice is uh, an, arg an agreement to stop fighting, uh, which was done on 11th of November 1918 to uh, mark their surrender to the Allies. Thus, the Great War came to an end. This ending of the First World War led to uh, what is called the Treaty of Versailles in uh, 1919. The terms of the peace were contained in five main treaties. Here, we would refer to only the Treaty of Versailles which was signed on uh, 28th of June 1919 in the Hall of Mirrors at Versailles, that is in France. The treaty refers to the agreement made uh, with Germany, who was blamed for imposing a war on the Allies. The persons who played an active role in framing the terms of the treaty included the British Prime Minister Lloyd George, British, uh, President uh, Woodrow Wilson of the United States, uh, M. Clemenceau of uh, the French Premier and V. Orlando of Italy. Terms, that is the provisions of the treaty. The first was war indemnity. The treaty declared Germany guilty of aggression. She had to pay a very heavy sum estimated at $33 billion just as war indemnity to the Allies. 
Germany was to evacuate the places she had captured during the war. The Rhine Valley. The area of the Rhine Valley was to be demilitarized. Germany could not construct any fortification either on the left bank or the right bank of Rhine. Moreover, all existing fortifications were required to be destroyed. So uh, any military encampment that was present in this Rhine Valley region, Germany could neither build or construct any more of those military encampments and any uh, previously remaining uh, such encampment had to be broken down and could, there could not be uh, any fortification either on the left bank or on the right bank of the Rhine River. Uh, moreover, uh, to guarantee the execution of this treaty, the German territory west of Rhine was to be occupied by Allied troops for 15 years, Alsace-Lorraine and the Saar Basin. The treaty brought uh, some vital territorial rearrangements. France, for instance, got back Alsace-Lorraine, which she had lost in the Franco-Prussian War, which was from 1870 to 71. Right in the beginning, we remember that Germany had uh, taken away Alsace-Lorraine from France, which was a very uh, highly industrial and mineral productive region. Uh, to compensate France for the deliberate destruction of her coal mines, so what Germany had done was when Germany had taken away Alsace-Lorraine from France uh, after this uh, Franco-Prussian war, uh, they deliberately destroyed the coal mines. So they over-extracted things from there because uh, they had just uh, managed to uh, capture that place. So they had deliberately destroyed the coal mines. To compensate for this deliberate destruction, what uh, Germany had to do was she was given full ownership of the rich coal mines in the Saar Basin. So the Saar Basin was a region which Germany had, was filled with rich coal mines. So this portion had to be given away to France, uh, a district uh, adjoining Lorraine for a period of 15 years. So Saar Basin was a region which was actually adjoining Lorraine. So this portion was also given away for 15 years. Schleswig, the fate of Schleswig was taken away by Denmark uh, taken away from Denmark in 1864, uh, was de determined by a plebiscite. The northern zone voted for incorporation in Denmark and the central zone voted for Germany. Eupen and Malmedy, another major territorial rearrangement was uh, that Germany had to surrender the areas of Eupen and Malmedy to Belgium. The city of Melmel went to uh, Lithuania. Independence of Poland, uh, the newly created state of Poland got back all the territories she had lost in the war. Posen and almost the whole of West Prussia was also uh, included in the Polish state. Uh, to provide Poland with a port, the German city of Danzig was internationalized. It was kept as a free city placed under the protection of the League of Nations. Trading rights through the city of Danzig increased Poland's wealth and resources. Germany lost all her colonies in overseas possessions. Beside territorial losses in Europe, Germany lost all her colonies and overseas possessions. Togoland and the Cameroon in West Africa were partitioned between Britain and France, and German East Africa was shared between Britain and Belgium. However, the Allied powers, Britain, France and Belgium, held these territories as mandatories of the League of Nations. Palestine and Mesopotamia, that is present-day Iraq, were also held by Britain under a mandate from the League of Nations. In order to prevent future aggression, or Germany's military strength was crippled. You must remember these numbers since uh, it is very important and this comes as a very regular question. Uh, this few, so that uh, they could prevent uh, another war because Germany was seen to be aggressive uh, from the military side, what they did was they crippled the military strength. The German army was restricted to a force of 1 lakh soldiers and the navy was limited to a bare minimum of 15,000 men and, thir uh, and 36 ships only. The air force was totally banned and no submarines were to be allowed. Germany was neither to make nor purchase from outside tanks and armored cars. So you can understand that just to uh, cripple uh, Germany's military strength, they had reduced the numbers 
hugely and this was the main part on which germany was uh, dependent supply of coal germany had to supply huge quantities of coal to france italy and belgium for 10 years since uh, the alsace lorraine destruction germany was bound to supply huge amounts of coal to france italy and belgium for 10 years Several countries gained independence. The complete independence of Belgium, Poland, and Czechoslovakia was recognized by Germany. The Czechs got Silesia, Bohemia, and Moravia, and were thus created uh, and was thus created the state of Czechoslovakia. Serbia obtained Slavonic states of Slovenia, Bosnia, Croatia, and Herzegovina, uh, and assumed the name of Yugoslavia, with its capital at Belgrade. The League of Nations, finally the Covenant, that is the Pact of the League of Nations was added to the Treaty of Versailles. There's criticism on this Treaty of Versailles. The Treaty of Versailles was undoubtedly a dictated peace. This was a forceful peace that was uh, enforced by the other uh, winning countries. Uh, one that would assign all the war guilt to Germany. The principle at the root of the treaty was to the victors belong the spoils and the allies are the victors. German representatives had to sign this treaty under coercion. The Treaty of Versailles deprived Germany of all its colonial positions and imposed enormous compensation in form of war damages. Her military strength was completely crushed. The peace arrangements therefore broke down and Germany under Hitler showed aggression in its political activities. This became an important cause of World War II. Remaining peace treaties, separate treaties were signed uh, with Austria, that is the Treaty of Saint Germain, uh, September 1919, and with Bulgaria, the Treaty of Neuilly, uh, November 1919. These treaties disarmed Austria and Bulgaria respectively and imposed a war indemnity. Austria Hungary was broken up, Hungary was recognized as a separate state. A separate treaty was made with Hungary, that is the Treaty of Trianon in June 1920. Turkey signed the Treaty of Severus in uh, August 1920. She surrendered her authority practically on all non-Turkish races. Britain was given control over Palestine and Iraq and Syria went under French control. So Britain was given uh, control over Palestine and Iraq and Syria went under French control. Turkey retained only Constantinople and Dardanelles. This treaty was never ratified by the Turkish nationalists held by, uh, led by Mustafa Kemal. The final settlement was made by the Treaty of Lausanne, that is 1923. Uh, this treaty restored to Turkey practically all the territories held by her in Europe in 1914. Territorial rearrangement changed the political map of the world. The political map of the world was particularly uh, that was uh, particularly of that of Europe was transformed after these peace treaties occurred. Their results in brief were as follows. We have already read them and this is a, a summary of uh, which area went to which country. We have already stated that Austria-Hungary was broken up and Hungary was recognized as a separate state. Germany was forced to cede uh, that is give away Alsace Lorraine to France. She had to surrender the areas of Eupen and Malmary to Belgium. Germany was also compelled to hand over to Poland large parts of the industrial area of Silesia. New states such as Romania, Czechoslovakia, Finland, and Yugoslavia were created, keeping in view the principles of nationality and nationalism. The war saw the end of autocratic monarchies in Germany, Russia, and Austria Hungary after the outbreak of the Russian Revolution in 1917, the Tsarist dictatorship in Russia came to an end. The League of Nations, the objectives of the League of Nations. The chief aim of League of Nations was to promote international cooperation and to achieve international peace and security. In order to achieve uh, this objective, the members of the League were required to uh, not resort to war, to maintain open, just, and honorable relations among them, to establish international law as the rule, uh, as the actual rule of conduct among governments, and to respect all treaty obligations in their dealings with one another. 
So these points must be remembered because uh, the objectives of League of Nations also comes as a very common question. Besides preventions of war, the other objectives of the League were maintenance of status quo, that is, situations that existed as a result of peace conference and the protection of uh, national minorities. Also, proper administration of the territories assigned to a nation under mandate, or that, is, or that means authority, of the League of Nations. Dealing with the problem of health and social and economic problems uh, and the system of communication and importation. So these four were uh, the other objectives besides the first four of the League. Its membership, the League, uh, actually began with our original 42 members and uh, the admission of new members was not less than two-thirds of the vote of the assembly. So in order uh, for the new members to join uh, the League, uh, at least two-third votes of the assembly was required. The United States never became its member because the American Senate did not ratify the League's covenant. Germany and her allies were also not eligible for entry for a few years with the joining of Germany in uh, 1926. The League's position and strength rose high. Its organs, the principal organs of the League of Nations were the uh, Assembly, the Council, the Secretariat and the Permanent Court of uh, International Justice. The Constitution of the International Labour Orga Organization, that is ILO, was prepared by a commission set up by the Peace Conference. The ILO became a part of the Treaty of Versailles. The League's failure. The League did much of social and humanitarian work between uh, 1925 and 1930. It was also able to settle a few international disputes. However, it failed when it had to deal with disputes in which any of the major powers was involved. It failed in its main object of maintaining peace in the world. So these are the points to remember, the summary of the entire chapter. I will slowly scroll down. If you wish to take notes from here, you may. So that was the end of the chapter. Thank you for watching. And I hope this video was helpful. Uh, like, comment, subscribe, comment your doubts. If you really have doubts, please comment. And there's a request, please be polite in the comment section and talk of relevant things only. I'm trying to set up a good uh, study environment here and not just run for subscribers or something. Only if you like it, if it helps you and share it to people uh, whom it might help, those who want to learn uh, sitting at home. So thank you for watching. See you in the next video. Stay safe. Keep learning. Bye.